قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh And welcome to this live episode of Ask Zad coming to you every Saturday between Maghrib and Isha time here in Mecca region. As usual, we'll take three questions of your emails and then we will take your direct phone calls. The first question is from a brother who says, is it permissible for men to apply hinna on their hands during their wedding or just casually? Because some Muslims say that it is sunnah of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to apply hinna. Hinna is a form of a plant that is used to give a dyeing uh, effect to the hair and sometimes to decorate women's hands with it. I think they call it in the subcontinent as mehindi. And hinna is a natural substance that was mentioned in the sunnah. And the Prophet himself والسلام, applied it to his hair and to his beard. And women used to apply it to their hands and feet and their bodies as a form, a form of adornment. So what's the ruling on men applying it on their hands and feet? The scholars say that this is only known to be used by women. And at the time of the Prophet والسلام, this was known to be used by homosexuals or transgenders or gays, not by real men, as per a hadith in Sahih Abi Dawood, where the Prophet was brought by such a, an individual and he ordered him to be boycotted and taken out of Medina uh, uh, to somewhere as um, a form of punishment. So it is known in our religion that whoever imitates women from the men is cursed. The Prophet ﷺ cursed those who imitate women from amongst the men and those who imitate men from amongst the women. Imitating the opposite gender is a major sin and whoever does this is cursed. So men are only permitted to use henna to dye their beards, to dye their hair, and that is it. Not to adorn any part of their bodies and Allah Azza wa knows best. Uh, Nasreen says, can I do calligraphy business? What all must I keep in mind before starting this business? Calligraphy is a form of art. And it's a beautiful form that, that people and artists can display their talent. And it's halal to do business with it. So whether you write people's names, whether you write poetry, whether you write nice reminders, all of these are permissible and you can sell if the content is halal. What you must keep away from is writing verses of the Quran that might be hung on walls or the beautiful names of Allah Azza wa Jal that might be used as decoration for walls. This is something that scholars say that is disrespecting the Quran and the beautiful names of Allah Azza wa Jal. Other than that, a reminder with a, a nice words and, and, and poetry and the likes is permissible insha'Allah 
عز وجل. Finally, Sarah says, can menstruating women perform sajda to tilawa? It is an issue of dispute whether a woman in her menses can recite the Quran or not. And the most authentic opinion that we've mentioned so many times is that it is totally permissible for a woman who is in her menses to recite the Quran, whether from her memory or from touching uh, a Quran with a, uh, a part, something that protects it, like gloves or a piece of cloth, or reading it from books of tafsir or from electronic gadgets such as, as a PC or a PDA or a phone. This is all permissible. What is the ruling if a woman comes and recites a ayah that has recitation in it? Can she perform uh, um, uh, an ayah that has prostration in it? Can she perform prostration of recitation? The most authentic opinion is that a, whim, a woman in her menses is not allowed to pray. A woman who, or a man, who is not in the state of wudu must not offer prayer. But prostration of recitation or prostration of gratitude is not a prayer. Therefore, if, a, if someone says Allahu Akbar and prostrates, whether he's doing it to the Qibla or elsewhere, whether his aura is covered or not, whether he's in the state of purity or not, this is totally permissible because he is not praying. And tahara, purity, uplifting the, ma the um, uh, ritual, the major and minor ritual impurity is required when you are going to offer prayer. But if you're going to offer such prostrations that do not have takbiratul ihram in the beginning and salam at the end because this is not a prayer, then there is no problem in doing that and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Latif from Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, thank you so much, Sheikh, for uh, your uh, give us the true part of our questions. Barakallah feek. My question is that, my question is that uh, when I pray for, uh, uh, the first salam, after that, can I must uh, change my place? If I pray the salah first and then I sit and make a zakar, you know, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, and the other uh, azkar after salah. And oh. then I pray the same place after uh, in the sunnah after the first prayer. That will be allowed. And uh, my question is also the same for my any roja woman, female. Okay. And if she, uh, she prays. I will, I will answer you, inshallah, Latif. So Latif's question is clear. There is a hadith or a number of a hadiths, such as the hadith of uh, Muawiyah, may Allah be pleased with him and others, where the Prophet والسلام, orders those who prayed Jumu'ah, Friday prayer, not to connect it afterwards with the Sunnah before speaking to someone else or changing and shifting their position. And the hadith also was mentioned in other fard prayers, not only Friday, where the Prophet says, Assalam, is it hard for you to go a bit forward or backwards or to the right or to the left before you pray your sunnah? And this is an instruction from the Prophet Assalam, to change your position. So the most authentic opinion is that after concluding your fard, you must not pray your sunnah unless you speak to someone by giving him salam or checking the time or standing and shifting the position a little bit to the forward or backwards or to the right or to the left. And this is the most authentic opinion. Some scholars said that if you concluded your fard and engaged in dhikr, that would be sufficient because this is considered to be separating the fard from the sunnah. But this is not authentic and it doesn't require you to be a rocket scientist to 
shift a little bit or at least say salam to the one next to you in order to follow the instruction of the Prophet ﷺ. Should a woman who's praying in her home follow the same ruling? The answer is yes. After fourth prayer, do not connect it with sunnah unless you change your position, the place, you, you, the spot you prayed on, or you speak with someone. But if you prayed the sunnah and you want to pray another sunnah or to follow the sunnah with fard, you don't have to change your position. If you want to pray your witr, you don't have to change your position. Only after concluding the fard, do not pray the sunnah on the same spot until you do one of these two things. Salma from the UK. Um, is like, I asked you a question on your website about Muslim. There is a hadith life. that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever initiates you with the question without giving you salam, do not respond to him. Record themselves anyways on YouTube. So I hope you understand that you have to begin with Assalamu Alaikum and then start your question. Are you with us? Hello? Yes. Did you hear what I said? Oh, assalamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Assalam Allah. What can I do for you? Um, I asked you a question online and um, it's about Muslims like uh, recording and sending at the same time. So does that mean in general we're not allowed to watch um, Muslim women like, and we should only watch Kafir women? I don't understand your question. Watching what? What? Like just Muslim women like giving a lecture or something or like they... And you're a woman? Yeah. No problem in women watching other women, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, if they are giving something halal and permissible. A woman can watch other women cook, for example, even if the woman is not abiding by the hijab, as long as there's nothing haram in that session, such as free mixing or cooking with pork and wine and flirting with the opposite gender. It's haram for men to watch other women give such lectures, whether beneficial, Islamic or non-Islamic. And I hope this addresses your question. CD from Germany. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. How are you, Sheikh? I'm fine. Long time no see. <laughs> yeah, I was being distracted. Unfortunately, hmm. but alhamdulillah, I don't can ask. How can I help you, Sheikh? Um, what's the ruling about eating insects? Because now here in Europe is being permitted that insects can be put in ingredients of food. So I want to know what's the ruling about it. Uh, insects is something that is despicable. And it is not something that natural people would enjoy eating. And hence, the vast majority of scholars say that it is prohibited to eat roaches, ants, to eat uh, um, uh, such insects that are found, even if they come and say it is full of protein and it's good for you, because this is not something that people naturally would consume. And hence, the scholars say that this is not permissible with the exception of locust, because locust, it is permissible in Islam to consume it, whether alive or dead. It does not require any Islamic slaughtering, and it comes in huge millions, and you can fill sacks of it, and it's beneficial, it's uh, healthy, and it's halal at the same time. Fuad from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Ahsan Allah ilaykum, Sheikh. Wa ilaykum. So, Sheikh, if a person gives the salam to someone and later finds out that he was a non Muslim, will he be sinful for that? Because we know that it's not permissible to say Assalamu alaikum to non Muslims. Barakallah feek. Wa feekum barakallah. The ayah in Surah Al Baqarah, the last ayah of Surah Al Baqarah, Allah says, رَبَّنَا لَا تُؤَخِذْنَا إِن نَسِينَا أَوْ أَخْطَأْنَا O Allah, do not hold us accountable 
if we were to forget or to make an error. When I give salam to someone thinking that he's a Muslim and then discover that he's Sikh or a Hindu, I made a mistake. I cannot retract this, but this mistake was an honest mistake because I thought he was a Muslim. Therefore, there is no sin, none whatsoever on you for this, and Allah knows best. Iman from the UK. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, in different countries, there are different norms for clothing. Um, for example, in Nigeria, they wear colorful clothing, and in Saudi Arabia, they wear simple and plain clothing. I was wondering if it's okay as a Muslim sister to wear clothing with patterns. Keep in mind, this is not embroidery. For example, zigzags, polka dots, or tie-dye on my jacket, dress, etc. This is what normal streetwear in the UK is like for people like me and others living here, especially the youth. Is it okay to wear these patterns as long as they're not vibrant and very attractive colors, rather they are mute and simple colors? Jazakallah khair. Wa jazakum. Dress code is related to both Islamic traditions and to the culture. So Islamic etiquette dictates that your dress code must not be tight, showing your curves and bone structure, must not be see-through, must not be imitating men or imitating women, and must not be attractive in themselves, drawing attention. So one must not wear something that is really weird that would make him or her stand in a crowd. If these are fulfilled, then we go to the norm of a society and a community. So if you are in a country such as Nigeria, where the people are used to wearing such colors, where if she were to wear it in Saudi Arabia or in uh, Qatar, for example, that would not be accepted because it would be too attractive, an eye attraction, and uh, distracting the people. In this case, this is according to the culture. So you have to go to the real righteous practicing imams in the UK and say to them, is what I'm wearing acceptable in the community or not? So normal color, colors that are not uh, um, eye-catching and not attractive, wouldn't make you stand in a crowd. Everybody's wearing it among the Muslims. Not that you're the only Muslim who's wearing it and everybody else may be uh, um, uh, tempted to look and investigate what's behind the curtains. If this is the case and they say it's normal, then it's normal without any problem, inshallah. Anwar from Kashmir. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, I just wanted to know that uh, sometimes we do teach in front of people so that they may learn from us. For example, if I see a person and he does not know that uh, when you stand up from Ruku, you have to say, Hamdan kathiram paiwan mubarakan fihi. So if that person is standing by my side, so I just read it a um, bit aloud so that this person may think that uh, or may ask me about these things. Uh, or we do many things in front of people so that they may learn from us. Uh, will this be considered as a form of riya, uh, showing off? Barakallah. Wufikum barakallah. Akhi Anwar, this depends on your intention. And only Allah knows your intention. If you do something like reciting a surah after the Fatiha with the intention that the people next to you know that this is part of the Sunnah. Or for example, in the Hanafi uh, Masjid, and they don't recite the Fatiha and you recite it a little bit, a little bit loud so that they acknowledge that you're reciting the Fatiha. They may be intrigued to ask you afterwards and you can teach them. This is your intention. What's your intention? To show off? Most likely not. Most likely it is to show people and to teach them. There is 
totally no problem in that and you're rewarded for it inshallah Anna from Uganda Assalamu alaikum Shalamatullah My question is uh, there is something called sea salt it has been advertised in a certain good radio station in my country and that it helps in in gene possessions uh, so my question is is it authentic can we find it in any a hadith or something like that no this is not authentic at all what some of the soothsayers circulate that if you put some type of sea salt on your doorsteps or in the corners of the house or if you burn some incest and, uh, 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 and, and, and some bakhur, and if you put some uh, black pepper and uh, organic uh, uh, balsamic vinegar, are you making a salad? What is this? The jinn is, is mashallah, uh, uh, picking their ingredients and they would like to know what the dressings are. This is totally bogus. There's nothing in Quran or Sunnah that backs it up that, oops, yes, the sea salt, uh, uh, jinns don't like it. They had a trauma with it in uh, 2041 or whatever. No, this is all totally bogus and it's not permissible to be practiced and Allah knows uh, best. Aqib from India. Assalamualaikum, Sheikh. Uh, Sheikh, I want to ask why cryptocurrency is haram as it has been like accepted by most of the countries. Even government has started to legalize it and there's no involvement of interest. You are speaking 60 miles per minute, and it's difficult for me to understand your question. So please slow okay. down before you get a ticket. Uh, why, why is the crypto country, uh, cryptocurrency still haram? Uh, because it, it, it no What is haram? Even the, why, why is it haram? What is that? Cryptocurrency. I'm unable to understand what is haram in some countries. You have to identify the word, please. Cri 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 cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrencies. Okay. Why is it haram in some countries? Yes. No, no. Why is it haram normally? Like, uh, you okay. Have, you have said that it is haram to eat. I, I have explained this in a nine minute video. If you go back to it three years ago, one of the reasons is that it is not backed by. Uh, um, uh, the central bank of trusted countries. Salvador doesn't count. What is Salvador? I don't know. I'm talking about a collection of trusted uh, uh, countries that come and back it up. It is not backed up by any monetary uh, or uh, um, uh, an institution that governs these things. And this is why we have these fluctuations in the price that makes nations rise and fall. And we've seen how people lost hundreds of millions in a heartbeat due to hacking, due to uh, uh, problems in, in uh, their internet, losing their hard disk, etc. So the way it goes up and down, the way it's manipulated by the likes of Elon Musk in a tweet, it goes up and down and it's not backed up there is a lot of ambiguity. Go back to the video and inshallah you'll find your answer there. Khamis from Greece. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, so basically I have a question. So whenever I see like someone, let's say I see a very beautiful car on the streets but and I don't say, I don't want to say mashallah because that person like he doesn't, he doesn't have a beard, you know, he, he's doing, maybe he's putting music out loud He's blasting it, so I don't know if I should say mashallah on the car because maybe it might be insulting to Allah, I don't know, you know. Okay, so what Hamis is asking, if there is something that I like, should I say Allahumma barik, though that person might be indulging in different types of sins, the answer is, of course, you're not saying Allahumma barik to him blasting the music or shaving the beard or being with a gorgeous, uh, an unhijabi woman or being this or that. You're saying Allahumma barik to a car. So this is by itself to protect and block your evil eye from affecting it. His sins 
are his own business. It's none of my business. And the concept of trying to filter people and to label them and to classify them whether they're righteous, no, they're bad, they're sinful, they're hypocrites, they're non-Muslims, they're Muslims, before doing such things is not a, the right way of living and dealing with others and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. We have a short break, stay tuned, and inshallah, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, said, The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, No one's wealth helped me as much as the wealth of Abu Bakr helped me. After which Abu Bakr began to weep and say, And is my life and wealth for anything besides you, O Messenger of Allah? This narration shows the level of etiquette and humbleness that Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, had in the presence of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. For he likened himself to a slave of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam by saying that his wealth was only for the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam as well as his soul and self. This comes as no surprise for the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam has more right on the believers than themselves. He, may Allah be pleased with him, spent his wealth in the cause of Allah and he consoled the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam through his own self. So the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam recognized that for him and said in order to build his stature and to remind the ummah of his virtues no one's wealth helped me as much as the wealth of Abu Bakr helped me among the benefits of this narration it is important to keep good manners and humbleness in the presence of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam thanking someone who has bestowed some favor on you as well as supplicating for them is part of having good manners reported by al-bukhari reported by al-tirmidhi and ibn majah albani ruled it authentic in his book sahih al-jami' the explanation of a sindi on the book of ibn majah and at-taysir bi sharh al-jami' as-saghir Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. We have Um Amina from the Emirates. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So my question is, um, there has been a lot of uh, occurrences in the West uh, for people born in the Quran. And uh, I just want to know that what should be our feelings and if we have to, because um, I, I live in the West. I go back and forth from here, and I do know a lot of people that do not believe in God that, that could do something like this. So if we're close to someone or we live around people that want to do something like this around us, what should be our reaction? First of all, it is a heinous act to disrespect any scriptures of religion. Because Allah ordered us as Muslims not to insult the idols they worship if that would lead for them to insult Allah himself. So it is a despicable act to do. Nevertheless, how many copies of the Quran do we have? millions and hundreds of millions if not billions 
What happens if we have a damaged copy of the Quran? How do we honor it? In order to get rid of it, we either shred it beyond recognition or burn it. So we, do, we ourselves consider burning the Quran, honoring it. Of course, this disbeliever, this kafir is doing it to insult the Quran. He's doing it to humiliate the Muslims and provoke them. If you listen to what he's doing and start marches and protests and burning shops and uh, attacking the police force, you're falling into his trap and you're playing his game and you're achieving his objectives. Rather, turn the table in his head. Don't do anything. Just say that this is despicable, this is a heinous act, this is a sign of being primitive and uncivilized. Full stop. Are we angered by it? Definitely. But there's nothing more Islamically you can do. A sister from Sweden asked me today about one of the big masjids in Sweden and the Imam said that we are calling for a protest in front of an, uh, 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 an embassy in Stockholm or whatever to protest and demonstrate against the burning of the Quran. This is not permissible outside of the masjid, let alone in a khutbah al jumuah addressing the people. This is not permissible. This is un-Islamic. But this is the type of quote unquote scholars they have in the West who are handpicked and this is what they teach so you can imagine what would be the result next week when they do this demonstration few hooligans would infiltrate the crowds killing a police officer burning a car destroying property and who would be blamed the Muslims in the parliament it would backfire and everybody would call curb the adhan don't let young women uh, wear the hijab ban the hijab ban the masjids don't let them come it has to be supervised no teachings of islam because of what so-called hot-blooded person came we have to demonstrate we have to do Akhi, it's un islamic but they don't know ignorant people were made to be representative of islam to lead the crowds without knowledge and this is our problem in the Muslim world when you go to countries in the subcontinent without naming names you find marches in the hundreds of thousands in the millions protesting over an apostate on uh, burning the Quran on this on that mashallah they are so hot-blooded they love Islam what happens in the process the poorest country in the world though it can be one of the richest with their natural resources but the corruption in the government in the parliament in the ministries in the businessmen in the islamic leaders they, they divided the whole nation demonstrations demonstration oppositions demonstration the government uh, authority demonstration go to the street kill loot do whatever you want we'll justify it but stay asleep don't progress don't evolve don't become a, na a, a nation that leads others rather be followers of tom dick and harry so this is problematic hate it denounce it but don't do anything that islam does not permit and allah knows best ibn ziyad from the u.s assalamu alaikum rahmatullah sheikh wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh um, I had a question about um, a man who, who's physically capable and has uh, the strength, who wants to pray sitting or lying down. Does he have to do rukur standing up and sujood like on the floor? Or can he do the rukur on, like, rukur on sujood like by lowering his head uh, lower? Is he capable of standing up? Yeah, he's capable of standing up. Okay. First of all, it is not permissible for a person who's capable of standing up to pray fard prayers, the five fard prayers, 
sitting down. His prayer is invalid. Zero. Why? Because one of the first pillars of prayer is to stand up when you're able in fart prayer. So if you're able to stand up and you say, nope, I'll take a rain check. I'm going to sit down. Your prayer is invalid. There's no dispute in that. Point number two. If this is a voluntary prayer, then you have the option either to pray it standing up and being accredited for the full reward or pray sitting down and you'll have half of the reward of a person standing up. So I wake up for night prayer, for tahajjud. I'm too old, I'm too lazy, I'm this. I just sit down and pray sitting down. No problem. My prayer is valid. It's voluntary prayer. It's not fart. But I have half of the reward because I'm capable of standing up. Lying down, this is totally unacceptable. Whether you are capable of standing or not, as long as you're capable of sitting. If you're unable to stand up, nor to sit down, then you go to stage three, which is lying down. How does a person sitting down prostrate like normal people? You prostrate on the ground. How do they make rukur? You have an option, one of two, either to stand up and make rukur, like the Prophet used to do, والسلام, or to lean down a bit forward like this while sitting down on the floor, and then go, you go for your prostration. As for the person lying down, it depends on his condition. So likewise, if he's lying on his back with his feet towards the Qibla, and this is a response to those when they see people sitting in the masjid, extending their feet towards the Qibla, say, oh, haram, haram, haram. This is not true. This is totally bogus. The jurors said that those who cannot stand or sit, or they're lying down praying, they should lie down with their feet towards the Qibla. Where is the haram in that? There's no problem in it. There's no disrespect in it. So they make ruku' and sujood according to the best of their ability and how they are uh, seated or lying down, and Allah knows best. Umm Maymuna from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu so a scholar said that if a woman says everything is fine in Islam, but the fact that there is an opportunity for men that they can get married multiple times, I don't like that. He said that saying such thing is kufr. So I say I searched for Islam QA fatwa and in the fatwa it was said that if a person dislikes some things, even though it is prescribed in Sharia, that does not adversely affect him so long as he does not hate the fact that it is prescribed. The woman who feels jealous does not hate the fact that Allah has allowed her husband to marry more than one woman, but she hates to have a co-wife. There is an obvious difference between the two. Uh, end quote. However, Islam Kiwe did not mention whether hating the fact that something is prescribed in Islam is kufr or not. Can you please ex explain this and does saying the first thing makes a woman kafir? Jazakallahu khairan. Wajazakum. Hating something that leads to rejecting the ruling is kufr. Hating something because it's difficult, it's disliked to you, there's nothing wrong in that. Allah mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah, كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْقِتَالِ وَهُوَ كُرْهٌ لَكُمْ Allah Azza wa Jalla says, it was prescribed, yani ordered by Allah, upon you to fight in war, in jihad, and you dislike it. And you may dislike something when it's good for you, and you may like something when it's bad for you, and Allah knows, and you know not. This is in the Quran. Allah stated that jihad is sometimes disliked. Nobody wants to be killed. Nobody wants to go out of his home not knowing if he's going to come back in one piece or maybe in pieces. But they do it because Allah ordained it upon them. So likewise, a woman hates that her husband gets a second wife. So the man says, no, no, no. If you hate this, you're a disbeliever. No, that's not true. 
I hate, she hates that her husband takes another wife out of jealousy, out of loving to possess him for her own, not be shared with anyone else. But does she reject the ruling and objects to it, to Allah and says, no, this is not fair, Ya Allah. Why are you doing this? This is not logical. And she says such thing. This is kufr. Not liking it is human nature without any problem in that. And Allah knows best. Umar from Lebanon. Umar. Assalamualaikum. Alaikum salam to Allah. Hi. So, Sheikh, I'm actually calling from uh, uh, the U.S. So, um, I, I just had a quick question. So, uh, I actually work uh, remotely for a big company in their IT department. In what department? As a uh, network support. In their IT department. Okay. In a big company. So, I actually work as a network support engineer. And this company is divided into two uh, sub-companies, company A and company B. For uh, company A is what I, you know, primarily work for. Uh, that company basically deals in selling uh, body, uh, face wash, uh, soap, perfumes, uh, you know, et cetera. But um, company B is basically, uh, they sell like, you know, ladies undergarments and, you know, lingerie and stuff. Um, I wanted to know, is this permissible? Uh, basically what they uh, want is for me to uh, do a simple task for company B. Uh, to like upgrade their internet for a departmental store. Um, I want to know, is this permissible or um, is it like, you know, uh, not allowed? Okay, first of all, company A and B, one deals with cosmetics and the other one deals with lingeries and uh, underwear and uh, the likes. As long as your work is not haram and the line of work of these subsidiaries or these uh, business units is halal, there's no problem in it. Selling cosmetics is halal. Selling lingeries and, and, and um, uh, women underwear is also halal. And your job is to enhance the speed of the internet. It's to provide for them uh, IT services. This is totally kosher and legit. What's not permissible is for you to work on their website where you post women's uh, um, nude pictures or haram pictures or anything the likes other than that i see no problem in working there inshallah muhammad from the emirates hello muhammad assalamu alaikum alaikum assalam yes uh, sheikh i want to ask a question uh, if I, my mistake in the first shahad uh, I complete the Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم محمد وآل سيدنا محمد كما صلى الله عليه وسلم إبراهيم وآل سيدنا إبراهيم في العالمين أنك حميد ومجيد. Should I have to do any sujood saho or no problem? So this is an issue of dispute. Imam al-Shafi'i, may Allah have mercy on his soul, thinks that it is recommended to offer salutation upon the Prophet عليه وسلم in the first tashahud. So if I'm praying Maghrib, for example. And I sit in the second rak'ah for the tashahud, and I finish Ashhadu la ilaha illallah wa la sharika lahu wa shallallahu Muhammad abdu rasuluh. He says it's recommended to say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad until the end. Then Allahu Akbar and I stand for the third rak'ah. And Sheikh bin Baz, may Allah have mercy on his soul, say this is permissible. There's no problem in that. So knowing that. If you've done this by mistake and added the salutation upon the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. In the first tashahud, your prayer is valid and there is no sin on you and you don't have to offer sujood sahu or prostration of forgetfulness and Allah knows best. Ibrahim from Germany. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu uh, I, I work for a company who make uh, uh, temperature sensors. Uh, makes semiconductor what? Sensor. sensor for the temperature. Okay. Yes, and t tomorrow I I am student and uh, I work in near, uh, uh, I near, uh, work uh, uh, like six hours or ten hours a week. Tomorrow I have to make connection between the sensors and the cable using gold, and uh, because we we ha they use gold because it's very good for uh, electricity and. Uh, uh, electric, yeah. and they sell it to the 
customers without مقابضه uh, uh, they sell it and ship it for him is it is it uh, okay to do this job okay so basically what you are doing is totally halal and there's no problem in that is it haram for the company to sell such a product to my limited knowledge they are not selling gold through installments or without simultaneously exchanging it the gold is a very tiny uh, uh, byproduct such as that found in PCs or maybe mobile phones very minute amount of it that can be almost negligible therefore there is nothing wrong in my own limited knowledge and Allah Azza wa Jal uh, knows best. Muhammad Farhan from the Philippines. I work with them with gold. Muhammad Farhan. Muhammad. Okay. Salman from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa barakatuh. Sheikh, in uh, Kafir countries, the laws and regulations are opposite to the Islamic rulings. For example, in marriage, the law of a Kafir country does not require the wali of the bride for the marriage to take place. So, my question is, if a, if a Kafir husband decides to write a will or wasiya for his revert wife, what is the Islamic way of writing it? Is it written on a piece of white paper and signed in front of Muslim witnesses? Yeah, Salman, are both of them kafir? No, the wife is the revert. And the, and the husband? Husband is kafir, the wife is a revert. So they can't be uh, in marriage together. They have to separate. If they separate and the Kafir husband wants to allocate some of his property to his ex-wife, which is not his wife anymore. This is considered as a gift. He can only allocate less than one-third of his wealth, entire wealth. He can write it on a piece of paper. He can go and write it with a lawyer. Whatever sells, whatever can be applied, because his family would immediately jump the gun after his death and claim that this is not valid. So he has to uh, uh, authenticate it with a lawyer in a uh, legal fashion so that it would not be uh, contested and Allah knows best. Uh, Sajida from Canada. Sajida. Who is this? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamualaikum. Um, my dad is a chef at a retirement home and he serves haram food there. Uh, and he told me to help him complete this annual test paper for workers working with seniors, which is required by the government. Um, and if he doesn't um, complete the form, he will be fined. So can I help him in this? Yes, you can help him in this because generally speaking, serving uh, serving the uh, elderly in uh, the retired homes is, generally speaking, halal. This aspect of his work where he has to serve them haram food by itself is haram. And this may constitute like 4% or 5% of his entire work of taking care of his duties. So I, I see no problem in helping him while giving him nasiha and advice and Allah knows best. Jawhar from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamualaikum. Uh, Sheikh, some clarification is needed regarding zakat. If a person pays zakat for previous years without intending a particular date of his sab in the mind, because that date is not clear. If an overall rough estimate still okay by taking different dates 
This is something. This is something between the individual and Allah Azza wa Jal. Let's assume a person did not pay zakat since Ramadan 2000. So it's now 23 years plus, and we count the lunar years, not the Gregorian years. So it has to be counted in, in like uh, in 14. Uh, 21, for example, Ramadan. And he's not sure whether it was Ramadan, maybe Shawwal, maybe the Qa'da. We tell him, this is between you and Allah. If you don't know, what do you want us to do? No, no, Sheikh, you have to tell us. What? How would I know? This is between you and Allah Azza wa Jal. So what to do, Sheikh? If it's in Ramadan and you don't know which month it is, just to be safe, say it is the beginning of the year. It's in Muharram. Sheikh, this is nine months earlier. Okay, sue me. How would I know? So if I say Sha'ban, you would say, oh, Sheikh, this might be a month or two earlier. So I say, okay, the, the Hijjah. So, okay, Sheikh, this might be a month or two late. Come on, man. I don't have time to waste on this. This is between you and Allah. You want to be safe? Go safe by going two, three, four months just to be safe rather than sorry. Nobody is going to take you by the hand and say, do this and do that without knowledge. Nobody knows when was the original date. And it's not something verbal or written. It's between you and Allah Azza wa You estimate and you act accordingly. And I hope this answers the question. Hasib from the U.S., Or Hasib. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. From um, Allah. I have a question, Shaykh. Um, so I have a, I go to certain events, um, um, like a business event, events, uh, where I have to like talk to people for uh, business purposes. Uh, but every time I talk to all these, um, you know, big CEOs and of the companies and stuff like that, um, I feel um. You know, like uh, some certain type of way, I feel bad and, because I can see their evil uh, eye and fake mask that they put on their faces. So I just have a question. Um, you know, I can't just like say like I can't go there and, uh, you know, I still have to go for the business purposes. So I was just trying to um, see how can I protect myself from the um, from those type of people and uh, to not maybe pay attention or how do, how do I solve this problem? Why would they have evil eye? If you're pitching for a job and they are CEOs, they don't need you. They don't give, you don't give evil eye to someone who's way down below you, who's seeking your uh, business and wanting something from you. So I don't understand your question. Um, it's not only CEOs, it's a lot of people that work with them and they, they have like, a, they, they have evil eyes. So like, and, and I don't know. It just, okay. Uh, so in order for you to protect yourself from evil eye, number one, you have to observe religiously the athkar in the morning, in the evening, after fard prayer, before going to bed, and before leaving your home. If you do this by reading the small booklet called Fortress of the Muslim, on my YouTube channel, you'll find a whole playlist of 70 episodes where Allah blessed me with explaining all the hadiths there by reading these religiously and abiding by them you'll be protected with the grace of Allah and you have no fear because it's like installing an antivirus you're protected it's a firewall that prevents their evil eye from catching to you and inshallah you will have the confidence to address them without fearing them and Allah knows best this is all the time we have until we meet tomorrow at four o'clock uh, well, 4.10, inshallah, here in Mecca region. I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Qul hadihi sabili ad'u ila Allah ala basiratin ana wa man ittaba'ani wa subhanallahi wa ma ana min al-mushrikeen.